When I was eight years old, I was baptized at the Forest Park Church of Christ in their old building. And just uh, some years later, I was in that same building and I, I walked to the aisle during the invitation song and I conferred with the minister and I was immersed that same day for the forgiveness of my sins. One of my uh, really close friends came to me not long after that and he said, well, now, why were you baptized again? Didn't you understand what it meant to be baptized? I said, well, now, if you had asked me, you know, well, what does it mean to hear? What does it mean to believe? What does it mean to repent? What does it mean to confess? What does it mean to be baptized? I could have given you the textbook answer to those things. I had a, an intellectual understanding. But I didn't understand in my heart until just recently what that meant. Isn't it easy sometimes to understand something in our head but not to truly grasp it with our heart? I think we see something quite like that in Luke chapter 10 and the passage that we're going to be studying together this morning. In Luke chapter 10, in an individual who is not named but is only called a lawyer by Luke, beginning at verse 25, he tells us, And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him, that is Jesus, to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Notice several things here in these verses with me before we launch into the main portion of our text. First of all, you see the lawyer's motivation. Luke tells us that he approached Jesus with a question to test him. This lawyer, this student of the Scriptures, this what we would call Old Testament scholar, he wanted to see if this new guy, Jesus, had reached the same conclusions that he had. If they shared the same theology, if you will. That's the reason for the question. And then notice the question itself. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Now that in and of itself is not a bad question. But in this particular case, it may reveal an overemphasis on works and rewards. On the idea that my service to God is the way that I earn what He gives me. And in fact, the only reason I serve Him is what I stand to gain. Now He asks the question to Jesus, but Jesus turns it back around on the lawyer, and so we notice next the way that the lawyer answers the question. He quotes a very known set of passages from the Old Testament. Love the Lord your God with all of your being. All of those different things that make up a person and your neighbor as yourself. Now we might say that's a really good answer. In fact, that's the very same answer that Jesus gives when he's asked a very similar question in Mark chapter 12. And there's some thought that perhaps this was one of the big theological questions of Jesus' day and that people were divided as to what the answer was. And so here we go. We've got the lawyer answering the question the same way that Jesus answers the question. And so Jesus says, you're right. You're right. Go do this. And you will live. For some reason that didn't make the lawyer happy. And you could see what was an academic discussion has become a challenge and an indictment 
of the lawyer's behavior. And now he's frustrated. He came to test Jesus and Jesus is not testing his knowledge. He's testing his ability to live the scripture. And so, in a last ditch effort, frustrated, embarrassed, he says, and who is my neighbor? Jesus answers with one of the most well-known parables in the scriptures in verses 30 through 35. And we're going to study that parable together this morning. He says, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. As we look at this parable this morning, we're continuing our series for the year, Walking with the Lord, and we're focusing in particular on the teaching of Jesus in the Gospels. And so, as we continue that, let's quote our theme verse for the year, and then we'll dive in to our text together. Colossians chapter 2, verse 6, Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. Won't you be my neighbor? As we notice, first of all, in the parable, the priest and the Levite, who have identical reactions, we find individuals who are rationalizing their lack of compassion. And if you look at these two men and their setting, we could say, they may very well have had good reasons for their response to the victim on the side of the road. There are at least three possible reasons that they did not stop. Reasons that generally make good sense. One reason is, this was known to be a very treacherous road. It was a dangerous place where there were, in fact, often criminals, like those who stripped the man and took all that he had and left him for dead. And so these men may have seen the man and they may have said, this is a trap. This man is a decoy. And if I stop, I'm not going to be a decoy. I'm really going to be beaten and robbed and left for dead. And so they passed on by. It may very well have been that they had an important place to be. Now if you look at the way that Jesus words the parable, it's not entirely certain whether or not they were on their way to Jericho or their way to Jerusalem. Now we understand that the temple was in Jerusalem, but because of the size of Jerusalem and the size of the temple and the number of people who were working there, there were those who commuted from Jericho to work in the temple. And so it's possible that they were on their way to Jerusalem to do their service in the temple. It is also possible that they were coming home after a stint of service in the temple and they were longing to see their families or they had some important appointment that was waiting for them in Jericho. We don't know. But it may very well have been that they had an important place to be and they didn't they said to themselves, I don't have the knowledge that it would take to help this person. And so they passed by on the other side. And then of course, it's possible that the reason that they didn't stop and help the victim is that they knew that in doing so, they would likely become ritually impure. According to the laws laid forth in the, in the law of Moses, particularly in the book of Leviticus, as well as in Deuteronomy, that if they were to stop and help this individual and he were to die or if he had certain physical ailments associated with his trouble, they would have become impure. And it would have been a period of time before they were able to return to their responsibilities in the temple because there was a period of a cleansing that the law stipulated in such situations. One preacher said they were torn between duty and duty. Have you ever thought... 
when seeing someone in need, have you ever thought the way that the priest and the Levite did? I have to make a confession. As a preacher, it can be very easy for me to adopt the mindset of the priest and the Levite. In particular, when I'm here in this building studying and working on uh, my to-do list of things for the church, the most dreaded sound is the doorbell. The second most dreaded sound is the telephone. And I tell myself, I've got things to do. I'm working for the Lord. But what if, what if the most important work that I have to do is on the other side of the door? What if the most important work that I have to do is on the other end of the line. I have to ask myself that from time to time because it is my gut reaction when the doorbell rings or the phone rings to hide and to protect the time that I have to do the things that I know are important things in the ministry of the Lord. I think there's a temptation for all of us as people who have studied the Scriptures, who are familiar with a story like this one. There's a temptation for us sometimes to think, I'm a good person. I'm a good person because I go to worship on Sunday and I read and study my Bible and I put my check in the plate and we equate the things we do with our righteousness. And that becomes an excuse for not being compassionate in the moment. Now we know, we know that as the people of God, we should be compassionate. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1 says, Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. James says in James chapter 4, verse 2, 17, whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. I think it's easy for us to know the right thing to do. It is easy for us to say, I am a Christian. I study my Bible and I go to church. And to allow that to become an excuse for not doing good in the world. Now there's a couple of problems with this way of thinking. One is, even as Christians, our own actions will never be good enough. There will always be more good that can be done, and the good that we do is not the reason that we stand justified, but it is the goodness of the only one who is good, God, and what He has done in Jesus Christ. We cannot view our service to God as a means to an end, a reward. We serve God, we do good, and we get a reward. But we also need to be careful that we not think that the things that we do as Christians mean we've arrived. In other words, just because I've studied the Bible, just because I go to Bible class, doesn't mean I have actually grown in my relationship with God. We know, Peter tells us, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, that we're supposed to grow in knowledge, but he also says we're supposed to grow in grace. Have you ever known someone who knew the Bible really well, but they didn't live it very well? It is easy to confuse Bible knowledge with spiritual growth. But they're not the same. And that was the lawyer's problem. He knew the Scriptures. He had the right answer. He had a head knowledge but he didn't have it in his heart he knew the Bible well but he didn't care about people so as we look at the priest and the Levite we recognize that it's easy to rationalize a lack of compassion it's easy to come up with reasons that we don't need to help someone else but that's not where Jesus' parable ends Because we see in the Samaritan someone who is looking at others with compassion. We talked about this a little bit on Wednesday night, but I want to go over it again because I know not all of us were able to be here. 
Three times in the Gospel of Luke, we see this series of events. The Samaritan, it says, he saw and he felt compassion. The first time that we find this series of events in the Gospel of Luke is in Luke chapter 7, verse 13. When Jesus goes to the city of Nain, and as he's approaching the city, there is a woman who has lost her husband and now her only son. She is widowed and she is without a man in her life, which was necessary in her culture. And the text says Jesus saw her and he had compassion. Then later when we get to Luke chapter 15, Jesus gives three parables of lost things. And during the parable of the prodigal son, we're told that the father whose son has left him, who has taken all of his possessions and has lived in a wasteful way, the father is waiting for that son to come home. And when he sees that son coming home, Jesus tells us in Luke 15, 20, he saw him and he felt compassion. And then we have it right here in Luke chapter 10, verse 33. The Samaritan saw and he felt compassion. Did you notice something about the other two times that Luke uses this phrasing? In Luke 7, it's Jesus. In Luke 15, it's the father in the parable of the prodigal son. The father who represents God. So in Luke 7, it's God in the flesh. In Luke 15, it's the representative figure for God. And then we have the Samaritan. The Samaritan's reaction to the man in the ditch is the reaction of God. He looks and he feels compassion. He felt for him. That's interesting to me because it seems to me that this would have been a surprise. This would have been a really big surprise for the people in Jesus' day. For a couple of reasons. We're, we're, we're so familiar with the story, it doesn't surprise us at all. But for the people in Jesus' day who have a different cultural setting than we do, who had never heard this story before, verse 33 would have been a real shock. And that's true for at least two reasons. One reason is, in Jesus' day, jokes usually started like this. A priest, a Levite, and an Israelite walked into a bar. Okay, not really. Okay. But stories in Jesus' day really did start like that. A priest, a Levite, and an Israelite. That's what they were expecting to hear. Jesus talks about the priest who walks by and passes on the other side. He talks about the Levite who walks by and passes on the other side. And his audience is expecting the punchline. It's going to be an Israelite. He's the hero. But it was a Samaritan. And perhaps you know this about Jews and Samaritans. They didn't get along. Not at all. The Jews disdained the Samaritans, they viewed them as socially, religiously, and ethnically outcast. They, in some cases, viewed them even worse than Gentiles. And so it would have been a real surprise when Jesus is telling this story to his audience to hear not just that the man had compassion, but the hero is a Samaritan. In Jesus' day, You've heard this called the parable of the Good Samaritan. There was no such thing as a Good Samaritan as far as the Jews were concerned. His motivation was compassion. It wasn't religious obligation. It wasn't financial repayment. The victim was stripped and left for dead. He didn't have anything to give. And it wasn't social advancement. There was nothing a Samaritan stood to gain from his fellow Samaritans by helping, presumably, a Jew. And there was nothing that he stood to gain from the Jews. They were still going to hate him, even if he helped another Jew. The only motivation that could have led this man to do what he did is what Luke tells us right here. He had compassion. Now what about you and me? 
Paul says we've got to be people of compassion in Galatians 6 verse 10. We're to do good unto everyone, especially to those of the household of faith. We've got to do good to everyone, especially to those of the household of faith. But I think it's far easy, easier for me, and perhaps for you, to come up with other motivations to help or not to help. It's easy for us to be cynical. And to say, if I help this person, I'm only enabling the problems that they have in their life. Or they're probably just a swindler. It's easy for us to say, I'm just too busy and I don't really know how to help. And I think it's easy for us to say, I've already done my duty. I put my money in the collection plate. I give to the local soup kitchen. kitchen. I help with the food pantry. You know, the problem is, we can do all of those things and those are good things. But when we see an individual in need, if we don't see them with compassion, something is wrong with our heart. So we see in the priest and the Levite rationalizing a lack of compassion. We see in the Samaritan someone who looks with compassion. I want to ask this question before we move to the next verses. What if the Samaritan saw the victim with your eyes or my eyes? Where would the victim have ended up? Then finally, you see accepting compassion in the victim. We don't often talk about the victim. Jesus says in verse 36, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? See, this is, this is really interesting to me. The Samaritan had no way of knowing We assume when we read the story and when we look at the context, we assume, and Jesus' audience would have assumed, that the people involved in the story are Jews unless it's stated otherwise. But we're actually not told much at all about this man except he was on the road, he was stripped, and he was beaten, and he was left for dead. Every possible way that he could have been identified was removed from him. He could have been anybody. The Samaritan didn't know if he was a Jew or a Gentile or a fellow Samaritan. And ultimately, it didn't matter to him. Because he didn't see a race. He didn't see a culture He saw a person who needed help. It was appropriate, I think, for the context that Jesus had for them to imagine this man as a Jew. That helps make Jesus' point very well. For them to think about a Jew being helped by a Samaritan. But if we're thinking about the story for our context, we don't need to imagine a Samaritan and a Jew. We need to imagine somebody just like me in the ditch. And we need to imagine somebody just like our worst enemy riding by and offering help. Can you imagine what would have happened to the victim if he had woken up just enough to realize somehow that he was being helped by a Samaritan and he said, get your stinking hands off of me, you half-breed. And yet, It's that very kind of pride that keeps us from receiving help when we need it. And it was that very kind of pride that led to this encounter between the lawyer and Jesus in the first place. It was pride. What must I do to inherit life? He seeking to justify himself. It was pride. It was pride that motivated the lawyer. And Jesus' story is a story that humbles us. And it teaches us that we've got to be willing to accept help even not just from our friends and family members, but even from our worst enemy. 
Do you know anybody who has trouble accepting help, even from their friends and family? I can tell you, in the church, we're some of the worst about accepting help. But that's pride. Think about that man in the ditch one more time. Because we were all there. We were all beaten, stripped, and left for dead when the person we had made our worst enemy came to rescue us. Paul says it like this in Romans chapter 5, beginning at verse 6. For while we were yet still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. One will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by His blood, much more shall we be saved by Him from the wrath of God. For if, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by His life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. You see, every act, every step in the plan of salvation, of, as we've called it, is an act of humble submission. Hearing. Somebody else has to do the speaking. Believing. Believing what? What God has done. What He has laid forth. Repenting. Admitting that I can't go my own way. I've got to, I've got to humbly submit and say, if I go my way, it's the wrong way. Confessing Christ is Lord. You know that means I can't save myself. I'm not good enough. I am not perfect. I can't earn my way. And being baptized is such a humbly submissive act that you can't even do it by yourself. Someone else has to do it to you. And that's when God washes you. It's an act of humble submission. If we can't be people who accept help, we can't be Christians. You see, Jesus is humbling the lawyer. He's teaching him an important lesson. He's teaching him that you can know it all, but if you aren't doing it, it profits you nothing. He's teaching that we've got to be people of compassion. We might have what we think are legitimate reasons for lacking compassion, but at the end of the day, we have to look with eyes of compassion. But we've also got to be people who are able to accept help when we need it. Notice the way that Jesus ends. He asked the question to the lawyer, who proved to be a neighbor? The lawyer said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. Look back for just a moment at verse 28. You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Then verse 37. Go and do. Go and do. The Lord has said it. What more can be said? If you need to respond to him this morning, we're going to sing an invitation song, and you're welcome to come as we stand and sing together.